So, hello everyone. Uh, this is Dimitrios Kostopoulos, uh, uh, hands-on diagnostics. And uh, today is the second um, webinar meeting in uh, uh, a series of 2021 strategic planning and meetings that we have scheduled for you. So last week, it was our very first one. And last week, we covered the um, area of hiring of staff. Uh, this week, we are going to discuss about budgeting finances. And uh, since hands-on diagnostics, as you know, is in the area of diagnostics, I will show you a way with numbers today how you can attain financial freedom with the incorporation of diagnostics in your practice. Next week, we are going to um, have uh, uh, another webinar in uh, the area of billing and how to, maximize, how to maximize your billing. As you see, the, this um, uh, agenda covers pretty much every single aspect that you need to do to create an effective strategic plan for the key areas of your practice. So uh, today um, we have as uh, a guest, a very good friend who has uh, 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 presented uh, before uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, hands-on diagnostics uh, webinars and meetings. Um, and uh, he is also uh, a, essentially the personal financial advisor of myself, uh, uh, and Dr. Isopoulos and an advisor for the finances of, of HADS, of, of the hands-on companies. Um, uh, this uh, gentleman um, has uh, tremendous experience in the area of uh, uh, finances and views finances in a very different um, way than, um, uh, than financial advisors that I have seen in the past from Citibank, which is one of my financial institutions or from Ameriprise, American Express financial advisor, all these big firms that they really have as, um, uh, uh, they really follow a, a kind of, um, I would say old fashioned uh, system um, that, um, perhaps may look a little bit less of your interest and more of their uh, interest. Um, so our guest today is Eric Miller. He is uh, the uh, co-owner of uh, uh, Econologics. Uh, and um, uh, Econologics is an amazing organization that gives specializes in financial advice uh, of um, uh, private practice owners, and I invited him today to start uh, this presentation uh, by discussing how a private practice owner can create a plan to maximize their financial success for the practice, but also their personal success. So, Eric, thank you so much for joining me to today, and please take it away. Okay, thanks, Demi, and uh, thanks for the introduction and for everyone there. Welcome, Happy New Year, and uh, I'm ready to get into it. So, uh, you know, the area of finances was was put to the test last year, and you know, I start out a lot of of my presentations this way, but it is um, it is a, it is a very true statement. Look, there's there's 300 million of us, and you know. Uh, amongst all of our differences and different points of view and everything, I think one thing that we can agree on is this, that less than one half of 1% of Americans have enough in income assets and resources to be able to survive the effects of a major health issue, a stock market crash, um, a, a lawsuit, or a government shutdown. That, that I think a lot of us do have in common that um, you know, a lot of us just don't have enough. So 
my my purpose today is is to really make sure that that you as a practice owner and look I'm a financial advocate for practice owners as as Demi said and you know my purpose today is to make sure that you have the necessary knowledge so that you can make really good judgments when it comes to your money and puts you in a position where you are not the effect of all of the big institutions out there whether that be the tax institutions or the financial institutions or the legal institutions or the insurance institutions i mean you know these are actually the the people that we're trying to fight because that's where a lot of our wealth is getting extracted from and you know our, our job is to really try to empower private practice owners to make sure that they are they're running their household like a business that they are treating their their business as a investment and that you are having that investment serve the goals and purposes of the household and that's what we're going to be really covering today now you know some of you may be working with a financial advisor some of you are you know already have a financial advisor and your finances are in good shape that that's totally fine Look, um, one thing I have learned is that, you know, not all financial advisors are alike in that, uh, in that respect. Some of them work with, you know, corporate executives. Some of them work with um, specialized in working with, you know, teachers or uh, engineers or, you know, whoever it may be. We just happen to specialize in working with private practice owners. And the reason being is that, uh, you know, about 12 years ago, when I started working with physical therapists, you know, I really saw that they were really underserved when it came to financial advice. I, I felt like they were getting bad financial advice. Uh, you know, I felt like they weren't really getting the results that they deserve for all the hard work, effort, and contribution that they provided to a community. So that's where our mission really came from, was how do I show practice owners how to take the, the wealth that they're getting from their practice, expand upon that and make sure that it channels so that you can, you can satisfy the goals and purposes of your household. Because at the end of the day, that's what all we're trying to do is, is make sure that your household, your personal financial needs at your household are, are increasing and that you, know, you really feel like you do have a bright future ahead of you. So... The, the topic we're gonna to talk about today, of course, is has to do with your practice and then translating that into personal financial success. And, you know, again, in, in working with over, gosh, probably 500 practice owners and having over 15,000 conversations with practice owners over the last uh, 11 or 12 years, that, that really has been the heart of it, is, is how, do I, how do I take this money? How do I channel this cash flow that I get from my, from my practice and integrate that so I can fulfill what I want to personally for my household to protect my family, to leave a legacy, you know, to pay off my debt, to, you know, create other income streams. And that, that's a challenge for a lot of practice owners. And that's what we're going to really hammer on today. So we're going to cover, of course, how to maximize the value of your practice. I'll give you some, um, uh, some information there. How to make sure that you have the right goals. You know, a lot of practice owners are operating on the wrong numbers. I just did a, a, um, a webinar on this. It's, you know, and it really goes back to the underestimation of how much you actually need, not just to run your business, but your household as well. Uh, and making sure that you have the right financial goals, not only for yourself, but for your practice. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about how to reorganize your practic practice expenses. I'm going to go through the two golden rules. You don't want to miss this. The two golden rules of income and expenses. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we will go over and evaluate, you know, uh, how you would look at your income sources in your business to make sure that you're utilizing the correct income sources, areas that you can help boost the income of your business. Everyone's favorite subject, taxes. Yes, I am going to give you some tax strategies so that you can keep more of what you make. And this is an area where I see that a lot of people are throwing away, not throwing away, but because you're not really working with tax strategists, more of just accountants, 
uh, you're, you're throwing away 20 to $30,000 a year, if not more in needless tax expenses. And, you know, that, that can, that can really help boost your, your overall wealth. And then of course, who should you have on your financial team? Like what, what should your team be comprised of? What should you expect out of your advisors, your accountants, your insurance agents? You know, these are, this is your team and you have to make sure that you're maximum, just like you do in your business, you're maximizing your team. You Got to do the same thing when it comes to your household and, and your household financial team. So those are the things that, that we're going to cover. They're all done under this premise though, that all of you should have an ideal financial scene for your, for your household. And that ideal scene, of course, would be that you have a, an abundance of income coming in from multiple sources, where you're free of all bad debt, where you have a practice that's profitable, sustainable, and transferable. Your assets are protected from taxes, inflation, and lawsuits, and you have time to pursue whatever life goals that you want. That should be everyone's ideal scene financially. And that's also what we would consider the definition of financial freedom. So how are you going to get there? Well, the first thing we'll talk about is, is the practice, because I think far too many of us, and I'm lumping myself in included when it came to running a business, you know, the first, if you're going to play a game, and this is a game in, in practice ownership, and you know, in life, you got to know what your roles are. And when it comes to your roles in your business, you really have three different roles. And from what I can tell in working with, I think the top practice owners, the people that you look up and admire and like, gosh, how are they doing this? How are they doing multi-million dollar a year of revenue with a 20, 25% profit margin? And it doesn't look like they're like having to treat like, you know, more than uh, 10 or 20% of the time. How do they do that? Like, is there some secret sauce that I'm missing? And the answer is no, not really. They just know what role they play in the business and they understand what their responsibilities are in the business. So there's three roles that you play. And if you wanna create a maximum value practice, these are the three roles that you really should know what their, what their responsibilities are and um, what you should do and how you become better at each of them. But really and truly they're this, they're the owner, the executive and the practitioner. And a lot of us, uh, and I'll, when I started working with private practice owners, you know, I think the, the practitioner role is the one that you're most comfortable with because that's where you went to school to learn um, how to be a physical therapist. Uh, and that's the one that I think everyone kind of falls back on. That's their comfort zone. It's the least compensated though, when you really look at it. It is the least compensated role that you have. Um, you have an owner role, you have an executive role and you have a practitioner role. The owner role, of course, is the owner that, that's the person that provides the guidance to the business. That is the person that sets the culture of the business. That is the person that's trying to look at the business as an investment and saying, how can I create this thing to, to provide as much value, not just to myself, because it isn't just about you, know, you as the owner, how can I set it up so that it provides value to myself, my successor, my community, my family, uh, my employees, everyone? That, that's what a maximum value practice would look like. It's not just about you. And when you switch gears on your mindset and say, how do I build this thing, not just for me, but for all of those people, it really does change how you look at your business just a little bit. And some of the things that, that we'll tell you on what to do, um, you know, you have to have that mindset. It's not just, you know, for my benefit, it's for the benefit of, of you know, all the people that are going to help me get there. And then, of course, the executive role. Now, the executive role is the, the people in the organization that get other people to get things done. That's what an executive does. And you can see that a lot of you have probably been trying to play all three of these for a period of time. And, you know, you feel a little bit like um, Indiana Jones when that big boulder's chasing him. And it's just like, oh my gosh, like I can't, <laughs> this is what's happening. Like I'm, I'm always like frantic, I'm, I'm everywhere because I don't know what my roles are. So my first piece of advice, my first tool that I wanna provide you is just make sure you know what roles that you wanna play 
in this game of practice ownership, because once you really identify that and you pick two of them, it really starts now to change it because th those are the two areas that you would focus on. And it doesn't matter which of these roles that you want to play, you can only pick two. You're always going to be an owner, but you can decide whether you're going to be an owner practitioner or an owner executive. And whatever, so if you're, if you love being a practitioner, great, stick to it, right? But just make sure that you hire and train really good executives. And if you want to get out of practicing and you want to just maybe, you know, be more of an executive, great. Then make sure that you have really good procedures and systems and a standard of care for your practitioners so that they, they treat under the same, um, well, with the same ideas and the, and, and the same uh, expectations that you would have as a practitioner as well. But these are the roles that you play and, and the best owners that I've seen um, pick two of them and they become really, really good at it. You're always gonna be an owner and that'll get into you know, how you manage your finances, but um, you really need to identify those two roles that you play in the business. Now, why, why is that so important from a, from a transitioning point of view or, or creating maximum value in your practice? It, it really comes down to this. You know, I, I, we see a lot of practices. There's a lot of practices out there that are struggling. Some of them are doing really, really well. Some of them aren't, a majority of them aren't. And what ends up happening to an owner that really doesn't understand what their roles are and, and you know, put the, the right systems in in their business is that they, they start up, their practice value isn't worth very much. And then over time, you know, they start, they start growing a little bit but then they hit this, this point of critical mass where they, make, they can make a decision. Do I really want to expand? Do I really want to hire individuals? Do I really want to you know, add more services? Do I want to like really make this thing an expanding business or do I just want to kind of keep it status quo? And the ones that decide they want to keep it status quo, unfortunately, this is what ends up happening to their business. I just talked with at least three practice owners last, last week that have that have been struggling and they look like this you know they re, they reach a point where their practice value um, they need to make a decision on doing something different they don't they say i'm just going to keep doing what i've been doing because that seemingly works but what ends up happening is that your practice value ever so slowly starts to deteriorate and by that time where you're ready to exit you're burnt out it's not worth anything now, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of work, effort, blood, sweat, and tears that you put in to practice ownership over a 10, 15, 20 year period. It would be a darn shame to, be, to, to exit out with hardly anything left over. So there's gotta be a better way and there is. And, and that way is of course, making sure that you are um, putting in the, the, the right blueprint and the right systems, having the right income sources and the right profit margins, the right financial systems, the right executive systems, the right marketing systems so that this practice can continue to grow in value. So however you decide to exit out, whether it's selling to corporate, whether it's you know having a successor come in and, and buy your practice out, whether it's uh, gifting it to another generation, whether it's selling to a competitor, doesn't matter what it is, but that you are getting this practice uh, and you're, you're transitioning it for maximum value. And that, that really is the game right now. So if we kind of forget about like all the noise that's out there right now, I, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm done with it. You know, I think the, the game right now for most of you should be how do I build this practice to, to get maximum value? And I don't really have any other game besides that. Uh, that should be the game from a business standpoint. And you know, you look at why that is so important and it could be an opportunity for many of you that are looking to expand and buy other practices because let's face it, uh, there, you, you can take a million dollar gross income practice and I can show you three different scenarios of how much they're worth um, based upon their profit margins, their earnings, and a lot of other things. And it's kind of telling because look, uh, a million dollar practice, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's not terrible. It's obviously, I think a lot of you would, would like to do more, 
but let's look at the value of it. Uh, a not well-managed practice with only a 10% profit margin is only going to fetch a value of about two to three hundred thousand dollars when you look at it. So this this screen, what I'm showing you right here, is just th this is how important earnings are. This is how important profit margins are. And you know, I say that because I know a lot of people have this idea that you know, hey, well, you know, uh, ten to fifteen percent profit margins are about the extent of what we can get. And I'm like, no, you can't think like that because the value of your practice really won't be worth that much. Um, if that's what your, your viewpoint is, you really have to make sure you're looking at it and saying, I, I need to get at least a 20% profit margin. Um, if I really want to have something that's, that is worth something to someone else, because let's face it, someone's going to buy your practice based upon predictable cash flow. That's what they're going to, that's what they're going to base it on. So when you look at a, a not well-managed practice, uh, I just saw two of these last week. They were, they were doing a million dollars a year, actually. Their profit margin was only 10%. So they were only doing $100,000. Now they were asking uh, almost six to 700,000 for that practice. And I'm like, it, it doesn't even come close to that value because that's not what the value would be based upon. It's gonna be based upon around a two to three multiple of that net profit. And, you know, I know that's a kick in the, you know what, to a lot of people, but it's the truth. That's what people are going to be willing to, to, to buy a practice like that for. Then you start looking at a well-managed practice, 15% profit margins, you know, your, your multiple may go up a little bit, but now you're looking at a three to $450,000 value. And then you take something that's, that's profiting 20%. Uh, the multiple is likely going to go up to three to four. And now you can see the difference. That's a six to $800,000 value. Same gross income practice, like nothing changed. Same gross income. It was just the profit margin, the earnings were higher. Hence the value of the practice was much, much higher. So I don't know how many Bitcoins you would need to own to get that kind of return, probably a lot, but uh, you can see the difference between uh, a not well-managed practice and a very well-managed practice. And, you know, for those of you that are looking to expand and, and buying practices out there, that's what you would want to look at, something that's not well-managed and that you could go in there and, and really put some quick systems in place and some, you know, some services that would, you know, increase the, the value of that practice in just a couple of years. And, you know, you can double, triple the value of something really, really quickly just by you know, getting the profit margins a little bit higher than what they were before. So I tell you that because I, I just wanna make sure that, that everyone has their attention uh, on you know, the value of your practice. It, it is your largest investment for your household and that not having a, a well-managed practice and systems can cost you. The other exercise that I wanted to provide to you today that I thought that we've done before that, that seems to have some worth um, was are you really looking at all of your income sources? Like when's the last time that you've really, really evaluated all of the different services in your business? And in the way that we look at this is that there are many different sources of income that a lot of you have. And I want you to just pay attention to those. And we have this exercise and, and, I, and I'll try to, um, for those of you that are interested, uh, I do believe we have this in electronic format so I can send it to you if you're interested. And uh, what it does basically is it, it forces you to say, okay, I'm gonna list all my income sources that I have for a physical, ther for, for physical therapy practice. And then I'm gonna rank them, each of, of the income sources based upon the profit margins that I get, the demand for that, and then how easy is it to, to deliver? Because those are really the three things that you would look at when you're looking at adding a service. What's the profit margin? What's the demand? And is it fairly easy to deliver? So uh, let's take a look at a physical therapy practice. So, and I know a lot of you, uh, we did a rank on this. I had someone do this that was in the physical therapy arena. Uh, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's right. It's that person's opinion. So if you guys see some things on here that you disagree with, don't disagree with me, um, disagree with somebody else, but you can always change these things if you'd like. But these are the different sources of, uh, of services that you would find in a, in a physical therapy practice. And uh, they rank them uh, from the ones that were the highest profit margin down to the lowest profit margin would be the first category. And here's what, here's what we found. 
Uh, this was the profit margins that they put down. So sports therapy was number two, aquatic therapy was number three, pediatric therapy number four. You know, I think medical accessories and, and you know, certain things that, that people would buy would be the lowest profit margin. Um, okay, great. So that's that. those are my services. This is how I rank them from a profit margin standpoint. What's the next part of the exercise? Well, let's look at the ones that are the highest demand. Okay, well, that changes it a little bit in some, to some degree. Um, the physical therapy would be number one, sports therapy number two, women's health would be a, one that's, that's number three, uh, workers comp would be four. And then of course, we're gonna look at then the easiest to deliver. And then we get into, well, just selling, you know, accessories are, are fairly easy to deliver. That's not hard to do. And then, you know, so on and so forth, we rank them. Now, what's, what's the purpose of doing that? Well, why you would want to do that, of course, is that you would want to then add up all of these different rows. So you assigned it a number, and then you add up all of the income potential. And then you rank them from lowest to highest. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you a bit of a marketing plan now, because those are the services that you would want to market. Because if you're really paying attention to your profit margins, uh, you want to have services and market services that have a really, really good profit margin that people want and that are fairly easy for your office to deliver. And if you can do that, then you know, you can ensure that you're going to have solvency and, and income coming in and all those things that you want. So um, that's one way. That's one exercise that you can do to, to, to feel like, okay, what can I do to, to work on my business this year and improve upon the services that we provide? And that's, that's one exercise that you can do. I find it pretty valuable to do that because it just gets you to inspect and look and evaluate and do things that, you know, you as an owner and as a, and an executive are really, really important and key. The, the other thing, of course, is that um, what is going to drive your income growth this year? So, you know, I, I talk a lot about to people, if you're gonna have employees and you're gonna have associates, you, you really should know what that person should be producing for you. If you wanna, I'm coming at from a financial point of view a lot because that, that to me, your solvency of your business is the most important thing. Now other people have other ideas of, of what's important, but for me as a financial advisor, you can imagine your solvency is the most important thing. So if, if we're doing that, you have to look at then, okay, how much should my associates be producing? Um, Am I training them correctly on how to not only sell services, but how to even mention things that we do? Tracking production metrics and all staff and your practice gross income. Um, of course, we just did an income source evaluation to find the services that, that are gonna provide the highest income potential. Certainly boost your marketing efforts. You know, If you haven't updated your website, social media, your online advertising, that would be something that would certainly you'd want to do and then make yourself more known reach reach out to your referral partners just make yourself more known that you have a safe a lot of people didn't do this correctly uh, coming out of being shut down you just have to remind people look we're here we want to help we have a safe place to operate and i saw people do that and it that's all it took and they were right back to where they were if not exceeding that just getting people to realize that you are there is is really really key and that you're a safe place to go to get help. So now to me, I think the biggest issue that most private practice owners have is that they're working on the wrong numbers. And what I say that is that uh, the number one thing I think a lot of you underestimate is the exact amount of money you need to bring in every month to be solvent. Now, when I say solvent, that just doesn't mean that you're just paying the bills, that you're just paying your rent and your marketing and your, uh, your, your staff wages. That's not what I mean. There are two golden rules of income and expense. I told you I'd tell you those. The first one is this, is that uh, any household, any business, any organization for that matter, uh, is going to try to spend every flipping dollar that it makes and then some. Every, every one of them, that, that is just a golden rule. And I didn't believe it at first until I asked uh, 
people for their like household expenses. And almost every time the expenses matched how much income that they brought in to their household. And I did the same thing with the business and they matched almost identically. So it just was kind of a phenomenon that was interesting. And, and it really came down to this, any business, any household, any organization, any government for that matter is gonna to try to spend everything that it makes and then some. But the other rule is that it will also, call it a corollary, it will also make the exact amount of money it thinks it needs to make to cover its most important expenses. And think about it. Like, have you ever been uh, forced to have to pay a bill, come up with money that you didn't have? And you're like, oh my God, how am I gonna do this? Okay, and then you're like, all right, that's how we're gonna do it. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. So instead of trying to fight these natural laws of money, why don't you just embrace them? And what I'm talking about is that when you're coming up with your make break number for your business, obviously you have to include your operating expenses, but what about your owner compensation? And I'm not talking about the owner compensation that, you're, that you think that, that you're talking about, which is just maybe taking you know, some draws every once in a while. I'm talking about taking 10% of the practice revenue and having that channel to the household for the purpose of creating other income sources so that you're not reliant upon the business forever and ever, amen. So that's a, a very, very different bill I'm talking about, but it, but it is very, very important. Look, most of you vastly underpay yourself. Most of you don't take near the compensation that you deserve for being the entrepreneur, for being the person that takes all the risk of putting the business there for the person that uh, his name is on all of the mortgages. If you own buildings and all of that, um, you, you know, you, you took a risk. You need to compensate yourself. Not only that, but you have to pay your taxes, the profit of the business you have to pay personally on your, uh, on your personal taxes. So you have to make sure you're incorporating your taxes into that equation. And oh, by the way, how many of you would, would really, really, really wanted to have at least two months of business reserves in your business so that you can function for a month or two and know that you have plenty of reserves in there? A lot of us didn't have that. So we have to incorporate all these things into what we call the make break number. And I'll show you how to do that in, in or, or an example of that in just a second. But this is a really key number that you, you, you must know. Uh, every single year. Now it's a moving target, of course, because you know your practices expenses grow and you're trying to expand, but you should have some semblance of a make break number that you're working on. If you need some help with that, then certainly we'll you know, reach out to us and uh, we can help um, you know, with that. The other number, of course, would be a, a number that I think far too many people just don't look at or ignore. And that's what's called the facility capacity number. Now look, all of you have a facility. It has a certain amount of square footage. It has, you know, uh, rooms where people get treated, and it has a number that, if this thing were at max capacity, if it were, you know, if you had the maximum number of patients with the maximum number of staff, and you were getting, you were selling all of your 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 services, what could, what is the potential? for the practice, what could it do? And you, you really shouldn't, I just did this with someone this morning and I, and, and you know, their practice, I mean, it's a fairly big practice. They were doing four or 500,000 a month, but then I, we asked, I go, what was your facility capacity numbers? Like, I really don't know. We worked it out and it was almost 900,000. And I go, that's the game. Your game is to get this thing from here to here because that's when you're gonna have a practice that is worth the highest value. So all of you, uh, you know, really take a critical look at your, at your facility capacity number, know what your income potential would be for that facility. And that's kind of the goal because once you hit that, then you know that your practice is at a maximum value condition uh, by hitting that number. So if I had to leave you with a couple of things on the practice side that I thought were really, really key, know your make break number, and then make sure you know what your facility capacity number is, because that really is the, that's the game. You know, you're, you're trying to, to get those two, uh, you know, in concert, or at least, you know, that's, that's the, the carrot that you're trying to, to get to at the end of the day. 
So, you know, I talk a lot about um, incorporating all of these things, the, these, uh, your profits as an expense, because you have to, it's something that you really need to incorporate as an actual expense. There's a very particular way to do it, especially on this one called the household wealth storage account. And um, again, I'll say it again, if, if you can get in the habit of taking the first 10% of your practice revenue, not, not, not your profit, your revenue, and setting up a system where it's channeling into some kind of an account for the benefit of the household to create other income streams, it changes the game. It just changes the game for you. And, uh, but there's a very particular way that you, that you must do it. Otherwise, it, it, you put too much pressure on the business too soon and it, it all, all hell breaks loose. So I don't want you to try to, if you're not doing this right now, if you're doing this right now, excellent, great, good for you. That's awesome. If you're not doing this right now, there is a very, very particular way that we would recommend that you do it and set it up so that it doesn't overwhelm the business with too much of an expense. Um, the other uh, accounts that you should have set up, of course, uh, would be a tax account. Uh, we call it the business savings account, which is, a, which is just a legal and protection fund, because let's face it, I think, you know, from our standpoint, looking at business metrics, you know, if you had at least two months of business expenses in a business savings account, uh, you know, you can kind of handle any kind of an emergency that may come your way. And, you know, whether it's uh, another shutdown for a couple of weeks, whether it's, you know, someone suing you, whether it's, uh, you know, some a piece of equipment breaking down that you have to pay for. Uh, there just needs to be some kind of a reserve account that has at least two months of business expenses. Some people say three, some people say one, I say two. It really is, you know, to me, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good median. And then of course, a business expansion and development fund. Now people are like, well, what is this, Eric? I'm like, look, uh, how many of you are kind of tired of always having to borrow to expand? And I know that, that, I get, I get frustrated sometimes too, where I just constantly see more debt, more debt, more debt, more debt, more debt. And it doesn't necessarily, now I'm not saying that debt is bad at all. I'm just saying that, you know, there are times where you can uh, expand using cash flow, and having, a, having an account that is capturing a percentage of your revenue for that express purpose is to me, you know, a good reinvestment back into the business so that you have the cash there to do that. But regardless of how you work these percentages, and this is just you know how uh, one example of this, it doesn't change the fact that a lot of you are looking at this right now and saying, well, gosh, there's you know I'm spending way more than 75% of my my uh, my revenue on marketing and my other business expenses, and I'm like, I, I know, and that's because you're underestimating what you actually need as far as what your make break number is. So if you're trying to operate a business and you know 95% of your cost are going towards you know rent payroll benefits marketing and all these other things then your your make break number is too low. So instead of 100,000 it probably needs to be about 125,000. And now you're thinking, "Oh great, so now how do I figure that part out?" Well, I can't solve every problem. But I can just tell you that a lot of you are very smart, able people, and now you can work backwards from there and say, okay, how many more patients would I have to see? What other services could I provide that would maybe be at a, at a higher transaction rate that would allow me to get to my make break number? And it just starts getting you to like be a problem solver that way. But at least you're not operating on the wrong number. And you're not always kind of like, oh gosh, I'm always strapped for cash or strapped for taxes or strapped for this, strapped for that, you know, because I'm operating on the wrong number. So just know what that number means. And I think that will, you know, certainly be a benefit for you. So uh, I, I did mention that if you guys would like to, I'm gonna schedule, it, you have the ability to schedule a 15 to 30 minute conference call with one of our specialists. And they are very, very well versed on working with practice owners. They understand the ins and outs of uh, practice ownership and how that relates to your personal finances. So I'm definitely gonna make an offer to you that if you guys have any questions, like just on anything I've talked about or just debt questions, asset protection questions, investment questions, 
um, anything like that, definitely take advantage uh, of that offer and we'll give you 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, who knows if there's enough of you, then um, I may have to jump in and take some of those phone calls. I'd be happy to do it. I love to do it. So, uh, but we, I want to make sure that you guys have that offer. And because Demi is so awesome, we want to, we want to, you know, give back to you. So uh, any financial related question in regards to your business, you know, we talked about the make break number, the facility capacity number, let us know. Uh, and you can just click the link in, in the chat box and I'll figure out a way to put that in there pretty soon. So, okay. So now I'm going to switch gears. And, and so look, I, I think the, at the end of the day, you know, the big thing is that we want to make sure that your household is run like a business. Your loyalty needs to be to your household, not just your practice. And I know I just spent an ordinate amount of time on your practice, but you know, at the end of the day, everything is for the benefit of your household. And when you start looking at your practice as something that serves your household, it just, it just changes the game to that degree. So I'm going to make your personal financial plan really, really simple, really simple. Like what, what is, what should I be focusing on for the next year? Number one, it's, it's having an income target and producing more income. It is making sure I set up an automatic and systematic method of retaining my practice income so that I can create future investments. It's getting rid of all my wasteful debt and wasteful actions. And it's making sure that I'm protecting my assets from taxes, inflation, and lawsuits. I'm a prepper, P-R-E-P, -E prep. And I say that because that, that is exactly what everyone's financial plan should be. You need to prepare. You cannot sit around and say, well, you know, I always wanted to get to this thing, but I never did. Uh, that, that's not going to cut it anymore. And, and I get it. You know, look, I know that you guys have a thousand and one things to do. And that's probably why, you know, it's good to reach out and get some help because you shouldn't have to do everything on your own. You shouldn't have to try to think of, I don't know if I'm making the right or wrong decision. There just should be a plan or a checklist there that you can follow and say, this is the right thing to do. But that is essentially what your plan should be. And, you know, I talked a little bit about taxes and I give you, I'm going to give you a couple of tax, um, tax strategies here, just going into the new year so that, uh, you know, you guys can feel like you're, you're getting something uh, or you can at least incorporate these things. Again, if you, if you have children, definitely put them on the, the payroll. That's a great way to get some, um, uh, a tax expense, a business expense. And then it goes to maybe a Roth IRA for the kids. Uh, Every one of you can have officer meetings at your primary residence and you can charge the business <clears throat> for that. 14 days out of the year, you can do that. And, and the rent that you pay to the business is a business expense and the income that you get to the household is completely tax-free. You don't have to pay any tax on that. So personal tax. So it's a great way to set up something where, hey, my, my business, I'm going to have a, a meeting with my, my executives at my house and we're going to document it and I'm going to charge, you know, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks. It's a business expense and, and you get that personally tax free. Certainly reclassifying income would be like, um, you know, not taking so much in salary and, and taking more in profit distributions. If you own real estate, there, there's something called a cost segregation that you can do, which is simply uh, accelerating the depreciation down. And again, if you guys have any questions on these or, or what these things are, then take advantage of that 15 to 30 minute phone call because we can go over some of these with you. And then of course we have a lot of advanced tax strategies. So for those of you that are like making over $400,000 a year, personally, um, we have some really cool advanced tax strategies that you can use. Um, that can really, really lower your tax rate by, you know, four or 5%. You may not think that's much, but when you look at the numbers on that, that's 20, 30, 40, 50,000 bucks. So if you're making over $400,000 a year personally from your practice, make sure you give me a call because I can, I can definitely show you how to minimize that. So lastly, uh, I think it, it comes down to who's guiding you. And look, I, I know a lot, of, you're a practice owner, you're a superstar, yes, you are. Uh, a lot of you have an accountant that you like. Great. 
Most of them are really good people that do a very good job of making sure your books are in order and that you're compliant in your taxes. But most of them don't do tax planning with you. Um, maybe you have a good insurance agent or you have an attorney or you have a wealth manager. Now, most of you have this on your team, but you always wonder why I got to run all these people. I'm the one that has to run all these people and I'm tired of having to run all these people. What's missing is really having someone there that can coordinate with all of these people and make sure that they have your back. And that's what an industry specific financial advisor does. Now that's of course what we do. And I say industry specific because I just can't imagine, uh, you know, you can see how important your practice is to your overall personal finances. And if an advisor doesn't understand how a, your business works, which is your biggest investment, how to make it worth more, how to channel money from there, then it's costing you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the missing piece that, that a lot of people have is just not having the right plan and, and the right kind of advisor to do that. So look, your, your plan can be very simple. You know, there's a defined result to attain. There should be step-by-step -step actions to achieve it. There should be measurements and a time frame to complete it. Accountability, statistics, and a, and a defined result. That's what a financial plan is. It's not a proposal to put money into a 401k or to buy an insurance policy or to put more money in a brokerage account. That, that's not a financial plan. That's a proposal. So if you feel like you're missing a financial plan, if you feel like you're, you're missing something, then um, it's because your, your plan isn't encompassing everything that you really need to get yourself into what we call financial beast mode. And I'm going to end on this because this is something that we're, that we're really going to um, uh, talk a lot about more in 2021. Look, when I say financial beast mode, I'm, I'm, that's what I mean. Like when I say beast mode, it's like, what would I, what would I look like? What would my finances look like if I were, if I were like in super beast mode, like things are going really, really well. I'm confident. I'm relaxed. I'm focused. But what would that look like from a financial point of view? Well, your practice would be growing 35% uh, over a three-year period. So that's not 35% a year. It's, that's 35% over a three-year rolling period. You would be taking 7 to 10% of your practice revenue and putting that into a wealth storage account. You'd be on track to be debt-free personally, house included in five to seven years. Your household income would be over 300,000. Your effective tax rate would be under 30%, even in New York, New Jersey, California, wherever you're at. Um, you are creating passive income and you're, you're about 30% to what your goal would be. Your profit margin in your business is 20% or higher. You have two months of business expenses reserved and you're following a plan, preferably our plan. Um, but that's what beast mode would look like. And I just want you to imagine what your life would look like if all these things were in place. I think it would look pretty good. And this is what we're trying. This is our mission right here is to get as many practice owners into financial beast mode as we possibly can. Because when you're in beast mode, you're expanding, you're helping patients, you're helping your staff, you're helping your family, you're helping everyone involved. And that is what the game is. And that's, that's really what we're trying to do um, is to get as many people into financial beast mode as we possibly can. So um, I'm gonna, uh, I'll leave it at this. Definitely, if you, if you would like to meet with us, take that advantage of that. Um, I don't know if we, we put that link in the in the chat box, Demi. Is that yeah? Just... I think Annette, 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 that took care of that. Okay, and uh, it is uh, like I said, you're going to meet with one of our specialists, and you know any question that you have financially related, and no, no matter how big or small, uh, it's really important that you you know. And when it comes to your personal finances, it's really bad when you're uncertain about something. So if you have some financial uncertainty, I just want to make sure you take advantage of that. And um, uh, I think I've far exceeded my time, Demi. So thanks everyone, no, I, I, the, the, I, I appreciate it, yeah. The, 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 this was really awesome, uh, Eric, and thank you. And I wanna take a couple of uh, uh, minutes uh, that we have left 
so I can uh, make a couple of points on um, the on some of the items that Eric presented here because um, be, being a private practice owner, I can totally understand what many of you are thinking uh, when uh, are presented of, of, of this situation. Uh, when you are thinking that, okay, you know, um, Eric uh, told us that we're gonna defer 10% um, of what we make in our practice uh, to a, a reserve account, to an invest personal account. Um, but what if that 10% at the end of the day is so little uh, uh, that cannot help us achieve our final goal? How, what can we do? You remember he presented this form where you can prioritize and put more attention to the things that make you more money. So let me show you real quick something. I'm gonna put a white, um, I hope I can put right here a whiteboard so I can show you something. So eventually when you engage with Econologics, what they are going to show you is if right now you wanted to create complete financial freedom, you would have in mind two numbers. Okay, they'll help you put together two numbers. That would be the first number they'll help you put together is the minimum monthly income to meet your basic expenses. And then they're gonna have you put together a desired, desired monthly income that does not only meet expenses, but really creates an affluence life, for, an affluent life for you, okay? An affluent life for you. I'm mixing my V's and my F's this morning for some reason, but anyway, so, so, but how do you get to this point, okay? How do you get to create this number? So you will need to invest a specific amount of money at the end of the day with a specific interest rate that you are gonna get from that investment, whether it is called mutual funds, life insurances, whatever that is, that at the end of the day will produce for you these numbers, right? But how do you get to be able to produce this amount of money? If your practice is a physical therapy practice that by national uh, standards, you are making 10% profit margin right now. And guess what? Yeah, Medicare is not gonna cut 9%, but Medicare is gonna cut about 3.6%, all right? Your net effect will be probably one or 2% less. But hey, if your profit margin is gonna end up being something like 8%, 9% at the end of the day, how are you gonna be able to create the numbers that you really need to achieve that bigger amount that you need to bank somewhere so that you can be able to create this minimum and desired monthly income? And here is where hands-on diagnostics comes into play. Because what we do with HADS, instead of having to receive $97 from an insurance company per patient hour, you are receiving three to 10 times more that amount by performing diagnostic testing. Average reimbursement, this is $97 per PT hour. Diagnostic testing, national average for an EMG, combined with a neuro ultrasound nationally is $700 for the same time that you spend for a full hour session. Yeah, in the beginning, you will need to spend a little bit more time because you are learning, but eventually you are gonna spend one hour and produce both of these. 
our therapists, the therapists who work in our organization who are very well trained, they, in an eight hour day, they can see eight to 10 patients and they can produce this amount per patient. So then look at this. If all of a sudden your profit margin is not a nine, 10% profit margin, but it goes up to become for a diagnostic business, 30 to 40% profit margin, how much more can you afford now to send to your investment account and how much faster that can get you to your ultimate goal of achieving financial freedom at the same moment that you are helping more and more patients. So that, that is what really can make um, uh, uh, Eric's plan for physical therapists even more effective. And, and, and Costas and I, we, we are working with Eric for our personal practice and personal finances for, for the past a few years. And uh, oh my goodness, this has been making a huge, huge, huge difference uh, in our lives. Oh yeah, also uh, for those of you who are not yet HUDS partners, uh, James, just plug in uh, the link where people can have a meeting with me. You can go to callwithdemi.com, callwithdemi.com, and you can have a meeting with me, and I'll be happy to explain to you about the HADS concept. Um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, any questions, anyone? All right. So uh, Eric, th this was pretty amazing and uh, definitely um, uh, we want to reintroduce in a, in a later date the, the beast uh, uh, concept. Yeah. Um, and at that time, you're going to wear your uh, beast uh, t-shirt no also to show it. to I'll everybody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, guys. Thank you all. Um, and uh, see you next week. Take care, everyone.